Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Eric with Suits by DFS, and welcome to a DFS preview for the 2022 Waste Management Phoenix Open. If you're new to the channel, welcome. What I like to do in this video is try to find the required pieces it takes to build the optimal lineup. And I do that by looking at a tool that I call the Bucket System, which analyzes the top 10 of this tournament dating back to 2013 and finds the common stats we want to be building our lineups with, or at least finding the players with those stats to build our lineups with. Because the idea is, if we aim small, we miss small. If you don't hit the optimal lineup, maybe we'll hit the GPP winning lineup. And of course, we're not gonna just be looking at the bucket system, we'll be looking at past optimal lineups to get an idea of how lineups are built within the optimal lineup, especially just with salaries. Uh, and then we'll look at tournament information as well as the golf course being played. We'll leave the player breakdown in tomorrow's video, uh, tomorrow's strategy video, where we'll be looking for our anchor plays to build our lineups around. This one is just about information, getting it out to you guys, so you can make decisions based off of what you hear and the players that you like. But before we get into the preview, I wanna remind you guys you can win some money this week. I am running some giveaways, the first one being a subscriber giveaway. If we hit 285 subscribers, you can see the week's goal right there. If we hit 285 subscribers by Sunday, I will run this giveaway, and one of you lucky people out there will win $10. If you want a free entry, all you gotta do is be subscribed, comment down below, and I'm gonna test your knowledge on the bucket system, at least for this tournament. Tell me which of the buckets is your favorite this week to pull players from. That's all you gotta do in the comment section, you'll get a free entry, and if you want an additional one, retweet the tweet that will have this video in it. Let me, let me rephrase that. The tweet I send out, that has this video attached to it, retweet that and you'll get an additional entry. You can get up to four entries to this giveaway per week. So all you gotta do is comment in each of my videos, be subscribed obviously, and at least share one of them on social media. That's not the only giveaway. Actually, let me pull this one back up. If we get to 300 subscribers, I'll, I'll sweeten the pot a little bit. If we get to 300 subscribers, I, and that's not 300 like additional ones. I'm talking a total, my, the, the channel count right now. If we get to 300 subscribers, I'll sweeten the pot. I'll make this a $25 giveaway. So if you're not yet subscribed or you know people who aren't subscribed, get them to subscribe to the channel. You have a chance to win $25. But that's a this week only thing. So if we get to 300 this week, I'll, I'll sweeten it to $25. So again, you know, the, you know the way to get an entry. The other giveaway I'm doing is a prize picks giveaway. If you sign up using the promo code SweetSpot, uh, on prize picks that is, and put $20 into your account, you will get a free entry into this giveaway, and I'm gonna keep running your name until it's called. So you're gonna win $20 no matter what. You know what? I'm not gonna make this a giveaway anymore. If you sign up using uh, the promo code SweetSpot, you're just gonna win $20. We're not gonna make this a giveaway anymore. I'm just gonna reward any of you guys that do sign up using the promo code SweetSpot. There is a link in the description below. Go ahead, uh, click on that link, I'll get you straight to the sign up page. So, it's up to you guys. If you if you wanna play prize picks for free, essentially, put $20 in, I give you 20, you're playing it for free. Prize picks is also gonna match your deposit, by the way. And for all those, all those uh, podcasters and streamers out there who say, hey, use my code and get 100% match, you're gonna get 100% match no matter what. Doesn't matter what promo code you use. I'm the only one giving you additional money. So if you are interested in playing prize picks, use the promo code SweetSpot and you'll win $20. Um, and like I said, prize picks is gonna match your deposit. So you're gonna be playing with $43 just by signing up using the promo code SweetSpot and put $20 into your account. So. That's what we have for giveaways. Sorry for that taking so long. But let's go ahead and talk about this tournament. We are at the Waste Management Phoenix Open. As you can see, it was established in 1932. So this tournament has been playing a very long time. I, I don't quite remember how long it's been played at this golf course, but this tournament has definitely been playing since 1932. The field size is 132 players, which is a little bit of... Or, I mean, it's less than the tournament that was played last week. Uh, a full field event's 156 players. So 132, um, I kind of make my hay 
with these types of events. When there's kind of a limited field because the cut is the same. It's, it's top 65 in ties. With lesser golfers in the field, that means there's probably a higher chance for your players to make the cut. Uh, average winning score is minus 18. Average cut score is minus one. And I, like when I looked at it, um, if you were to put like a, a mean on there, which is trying to find the most common score, minus one was your most common cut score. I think the, the lowest cut score was minus four. And the highest one I think was two over. Maybe it was one over. But either way, your average cut score is minus one. The strength of field is 541, which is a pretty high strength of field. And I couldn't look before doing this video to see what the average strength of fields were. But I can tell you what, it was considerably less. John Rahm is the number one golfer in the field. He brings with him 49 strength of field points just to add to this. So if he did withdraw, this would drop below 500. Um, and we saw that kind of like last week with the 18T Pro-Am where Will Zalatoris withdrew and so did Daniel Berger. And it dropped it from like 240 to 189 or something like that. So it became a really weak strength of field. Uh, much, much tougher this week for all the players. It's a pretty good field. And it actually created some soft pricing, which was, it's, it's nice. Like that's, it's fun building DraftKings lineups with like Mito Pereira at 7,000 as opposed to 8,300 like he was last week. Um, so it makes, it makes you feel good about building your lineups with the softer price. And that's how it is at the, the majors as well. So I like that this week. We have 81 degrees um, Friday, 79 degrees on, I'm sorry, 81 on Thursday, 79 on Thursday. <laughs> let, me, let me restart. 81 degrees on Thursday, 79 degrees Friday and barely any wind. Thursday's forecast was five to 10 miles an hour, and Friday's forecast just said light variable winds, much like what we saw at Friday's round at the AT&T Pro-Am. There's like no wind. So I think scoring conditions are gonna be optimal. Um, it, I mean, let me talk a little bit more when we get into the golf course, but I think, I think we'll probably see a cut score minus three, and probably see an average winning score minus 21, if I'm being honest. I think it's gonna be over, Minus, or it's going to be under minus 20. Um, and the cut score is going to be pretty good. Unless there was like a really windy day that happened Saturday or Sunday. But going on to the course information, we are at TPC Scottsdale. The architect is Tom Weiskopf and Jay Morish. In 2014, a renovation was done where Weiskopf came back in and renovated the golf course. So it's got his handprints all over it. If you want to look at any other Weiskopf golf designs or anything like that or you know golf courses that he has designed if they played on the pj tour it's probably going to be worthwhile to look at unless it goes further back than 2013 then i don't think it really matters uh you could actually make that argument like for like 2015 and beyond probably doesn't really matter because we don't have a lot of those golfers in the field this week and if we do they probably aren't the same player they once were so probably don't you know don't pay too much attention to that now we are on okay here's here's a wonderful thing we are on a golf course it's it's a desert golf course um it's too cold for the bermuda grass to grow and i'm i'm starting to grow even more disappointed in the dfs industry because you got a lot of top names just classifying this golf course wrong there's no bermuda on this golf course it, it is the base layer but it's gone dormant and you're gonna see that in the rough again just like you did at the American Express. And I, like I said, I can't stand when you got your top names in this industry saying that this is all Bermuda. It isn't. It just shows you they don't know anything about golf course agriculture or agronomy or anything to do with golf course management. Like, just don't listen to them when they talk about that. You don't want to look at Bermuda stats. It's overseeded with Ryan Fescue all the way through the course until you get to the greens. And by the way, they're gonna leave some of the rough dormant. So it's gonna look yellow. And it's gonna look almost the same color as all the sand that you'll be seeing on the on the, the broadcast as well. But you got Ryan Fescue, fairways, rough, tee boxes. Uh, and then on the greens, uh, last year they didn't add bent grass to the mix, but I'm seeing this year they did. It may or may not be true, but from everything that I've ever heard any of the players talking about, it's almost like putting, I mean, 
it's putting on rye grass, but it, if there's a, a similar grass, I mean, it's, it might be a little grainy, but I don't really think so. Like, I just remember the broadcast talking about how easy these greens are. They're relatively flat. Um, they're not super grainy. Although, like, thinking about ryegrass, ryegrass is a grainy grass. But either way, POA, bent, it makes very, very clean putting surfaces. I like to use bent grass stats when it comes to my putting. Being a golfer that does putt on bent grass... Uh, and ryegrass, like the two, they're almost interchangeable. Now, ryegrass, you, you, I mean, you can't really cut it as low as bent grass, so you find more slower greens that have ryegrass on it, but they're not going to do that here with PGA. So th these are going to be rolling pretty quick. I think they're a 12 on the stimp with flat greens. That's, that's like really optimal for putting. I would love to putt on these greens. Like that would be really great. So either way, if you're going to do any kind of putting model, um, it's definitely not Bermuda grass. Just don't do it. Uh, I think, I mean, if you want to, you could go POA, but you got to be looking at golf courses that are overseeded. Those are the only times that I'd actually t put any kind of consideration into putting stats this week at the American express. I, I mean, I did put putting stats. I used bent grass also for that. Didn't really turn out to be super successful. So just giving you a heads up on that. Um, but I've always, the American Express, just take grass stats out because it's an overseed. It's not going to have the, the full characteristics of any of the grasses that are being used. So whereas mostly POA flowers, just like at the, po uh, at the uh, Pebble Beach Pro-Am, you're not getting that POA here. You're also not getting pure bent grass greens, which you would see at Augusta. You're not going to get rye grass greens because you have all the other things that are included. So... It's just a mix, and, and maybe you just don't look at those putting splits. And in all reality, do they even work anyways? You know, if you look at your top 20 golfers on any kind of putting surface, you're going to get like two or three golfers that are going to finish inside the top 10. So really, it probably doesn't matter, if we're going to be honest. And that's my long rant for this. Way longer than I wanted to do it, but that's how I look. And then I got shot shapes right here, as you can see, off the tee approach. This is a pretty wide open golf course, minus the desert. Um... It doesn't matter with shot shape. And for those that are saying, you know, you still got to worry about the desert. No, you don't. I mean, Jordan Spieth proved it last year. He was in the desert all over the place, was able to hit some really good shots into the greens and still make his birdies. He scored really well by having a really bad driving performance. Now, that's not to say that's the truth for everybody, but I'm not going to, I'm going to, when I listen to that, I'm going to take it all with a grain of, uh, grain of sand. Like it just not that big of a deal. All right, let's get into the bucket system. Actually, no, let's get into past optimal lineups. So we'll start at 2018 or with 2018 and look at the golfers in the optimal lineup. So in 2018, the salary used was 46,800. It left $3,200 on the table. No 10K golfers, no 9K golfers, all 8 and 7K golfers. To me, don't worry about this. Uh, in fact, you know, the sweet spot process, I like to get all, you know, six of my golfers inside the top 10. And I usually try to find the best lineup, you know, outside of the optimal lineup that would still beat a GPP winning lineup. You really don't get that here. Like there's nobody, uh, high enough price to actually get close to the $50,000 that you would need to spend. I mean, that we want to spend, get close to 50 so if we were to do it, it'd be like this, which gets us to 48,300. Still can't do it. You'd have to drop down to 11th place. You know, maybe start with John Rahm and grab some of these guys. Like this right here would be 49,400, which would absolutely work. You know, you're going to sub out Matt Kuchar, put John Rahm in there. So it would be 11,000, 8,000, and four sevens. So that's one way to look at it. Um, but yeah, the optimal lineup did not have John Rahm in it. In 2019, I do have three categories up here that you can see. Optimal lineup, $5 GPP winning lineup, and the realistic optimal. So again, we kind of discussed what that realistic optimal is. It's all six golfers inside the top 10. And their salaries have to be combined to be over 49,000 and still beat the GPP winning lineup when it comes to points. Now, it doesn't look like I even have points up, so I can't even validate this right now. But your optimal had a nine, uh, let's see. 
So Optimal used 48,700, by the way. So you left $1,300 on the table. And we used a 9K, two 8Ks, three 8Ks, sorry, a seven and a six. And that equals 48,700. So three 8K golfers, a 9K golfer, seven and a six. So that's pretty, um, that's, that's a pretty con conservative lineup. Like that's a pretty balanced lineup. You know, going with that many eights and nines. Sure, we you did drop down to a six K, but still, you know, that's that's pretty conservative. Um conservative. I mean balanced. Of course, uh the, the realistic optimal I should say is subbing out Ches Revi and putting in Matt Kuchar for five hundred dollars more. This gets over forty nine thousand, meaning we didn't use an eleven K golfer or a ten K golfer, I should say. Ten K and up. But you certainly could. I mean, you could go like this route where you grab uh, JT at 11,000 who finished ninth. And then I think we can put... Um, shoot, I had done this earlier. Is it Russell Knox? Yeah, Russell Knox would work. He was. This makes this lineup 49,500. Uh, Harold Varno III would work. That's 49,300. Um, and they're all inside the top 10. I don't know if they beat the GPP winning lineup, but the GPP winning lineup only had three golfers inside the top 10. So I don't think it really matters. Um, looking at 2020, your optimal lineup used all $50,000 of the salary. This time we actually do have points. Uh, it scored 656, whereas the $5 scored 630. So, I mean, there was 26 points between them. And that GPP winning lineup score, uh, used up 49,900. So the optimal... Webb at 10, Fino at 9, Bubba at 9, two low 7Ks and a 6K. So basically 10, 9, 9, 7, 7, 6. The GPP winning lap went 10, 9, 9, 6, 7, 4 down here with JB Holmes, and then 6, 7 Luke List. Um, I do believe there are some good 6K golfers in the field this week. So maybe that's where we try to find someone like a Luke List. Maybe. Um, I'm more obviously interested in the top 10 and trying to find golfers that, you know, fit that mold up there. But yeah, you didn't have to, uh, leave a lot of money on the table to either win the GPP wing lineup or get the optimal optimal used all 50,000. So keep that in mind. And then 2021, your optimal left a lot of money on the table. $2,300 GPP winning did not, uh, use all 50,000. And of course, I created a realistic optimal that I didn't name realistic optimal. But starting with the optimal lineup, it used an 8K, 11K, low 6, high 7, mid 7, and mid 6. So two 6K golfers, two 7K golfers, an 11, and an 8. The GPP winning lineup used an 11K, 7-7, seven, seven, 9, Scotty Scheffler that is, 7-7, seven, seven, Sam Burns, and 6,900, Matt Jones. So that's pretty close to your traditional build, you know, the 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6, but this one was 10, 9, 9. Was it 10, 9, 9? I already forgot. It was not. It was 11 and then a 9 and 1, 2, 3, 7s and a 6. So somewhat close. The realistic optimal used an 11K, 9K, 8K, 7, and two sixes. That's... Hmm. I wouldn't I I wouldn't really uh advertise using two six K golfers, but obviously it can be done. Just just giving you guys a heads up. So those are your past optimal lineups. Let's and that and that's mostly we're looking at those because of salary reasons, trying to figure out kind of a, a common salary build to go with, and it's all over the place. So there's not really one to use. Let's get into the bucket system. And that's going to end, you know, that's going to conclude this video. Again, if you want a free entry into the giveaway, tell me your favorite bucket. So as we get into this, we put a filter on this and talk about each stat individually. So there's six stat categories, if you weren't aware. We're looking at last year's stats, last week's stats, course history stats, recent form stats, salary, and stroke scan stats. Those six. And they have six buckets for each of them. And bucket or golfers lay in these buckets, and I'll 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 explain it. But first one to look at is salaries. 
We already went through the pass optimal lineups, talked about salaries, so you guys kind of have an understanding of how most of the optimal lineups were built. Here's kind of a breakdown of how that looks dating uh, for salaries it dates back to 2018 so everything we just talked about you can see uh in this column is basically your the, it's a count how often has a salary you know that that is depicted right next to the number how often has that shown up inside the top 10 clearly far and away the biggest one is your 7ks so obviously we're going to need a 7k golfer it looks like uh to go a little bit further this column here is the frequency rate this is to tell you how often has this bucket shown up inside the top 10 for each year. And it's not so much how often. It's just, has it happened each year? If so, it'd be 100%. You know, we have four years of salary data. So these 75% mean it's happened three out of four years. And you can also look at this number here, the minimum. This is the, the minimum amount of times it's happened uh, inside the top 10. So looking at this, Every single year that we've had salaries for this tournament, at least two every single year has finished inside the top 10 from the 7K range. So it would appear we need 7Ks. Uh, the projections I have here take into account the strength of field that's applied to that, that bucket. Uh, it looks at how many golfers are in that bucket this year and the success rate of that bucket, which is of all the golfers in, this, in these buckets, dating back to 2018, how, or what is the success rate? How many of them compared to how many, how many finished inside the top 10 compared to how many there are? That gets you a, you know, a pretty easy calculation. So as we look at this, um, again, 7K is your top one. I'm only projecting one to two though. One to three, really. So keep that in mind, bear that in mind. Whereas that's the same number I'm pro uh, projecting for t uh, 10K golfers. So basically, I'm going to tell you, you need a 10K golfer. There is a chance that 9Ks don't produce a top 10. That 0.97 means there's like a 3% chance it doesn't happen. But looks like we have a pretty good chance of an 8K finishing inside the top 10. So, I mean, it looks like you want a 10, 9, 8, 7. And then probably sprinkle in another 7 and try to decide of the 6Ks which one you want. And it's really interesting to see the lower 6Ks, which is 6,400 and below. Really interesting to see that they're the better bucket in the 6K range. Crazy. It might have to do with how many more golfers there are. And the fact that there's actually strength of field in that bucket, which is insane. Like, I, I just don't get it. It's weird. So that's your salary buckets. So hopefully you understand as we go through this how it all looks. Uh, I'm going to leave strokes gain to the end. It's a little bit different, but I think the best way to start is probably looking at course history uh, when we look at these other stats. So again, or, or I should say how course history stats look as opposed to sa uh, the salary buckets is I have these ranges here, 1 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 plus, and did not play. This is their average finishing position for this tournament dating back to 2013. And whatever that number is, they fall into that bucket. So your fourth ranked bucket are golfers that have a really good course history. And it's only ranked fourth because of how, like how often it's shown up inside the top 10, dating back to 20, I think 15, because I started course history with 2015. Um, pretty darn close though with all of these numbers. So don't pay the ranks any attention. It's all about the projections. That's where I like to look at to try to figure out which bucket to choose from. Um, but you can also see frequency rates here. So we have seen these top three buckets show up inside the top 10 100% of the time. And I'm projecting, well, two of the buckets actually to at least have one, if not more. Whereas this course history four has a chance to not produce one single golfer inside the top 10. So using your best course history may not be the best thing to do, but I do have to mention that, you know, there's a chance there could be two. Like that's what this number is. Remember everything in your maximum projections, you round up everything in your minimum projections, you round down. So 0.69 becomes zero. 1.15 becomes two. 
Uh, and it looks like, you know, it's a pretty even bucket all the way across. There isn't really a good tell one way or the other. If you want a little bit more of a tiebreaker, I do have optimal lineup, like the frequencies of them showing inside the optimal lineup right here. Um, but yeah, it, the, the choice is up to you. I mean, I'm probably going to play a pretty mixed, like, even though these do say one, I, I might use this one and, and make, you know, the optimizer choose at least one golfer from this one all the time. The other ones I'm going to leave open, I think, and just, you know, zero to two, zero to two, zero to two for all of them. This one will be like one to three. Um, moving on from there, we'll look at recent form. You know, it's a, another great range type of thing. So again, your average finishing position would fall in these ranges, but instead of looking at, you know, the last X years, for recent form, I'm looking at the last seven weeks, which is really the last eight weeks, including this tournament, but the last seven weeks of tournaments minus this one. So that's how my recent form looks, just so you guys are aware. And their average finishing position, position, if they fall in these buckets, that's where they land. That's what type of bucket they're in. So when, it, when we look at this, you can also see the ranks, again, are based off of the, the number of times they show up inside the top 10, which doesn't mean anything if bad golfers are representing this bucket. That's why I have the projections, because it takes into account strength of field. Uh, and you can see your highest strength of field is actually the 60 to 80 range. And your second one is your best recent form, 1 to 20. That's their average finishing position uh, in the last seven weeks, last seven tournaments. Which I think there's really only six, maybe five, because it goes all the way back to the tournament champions. I don't go any further back than that because there's too many weeks of not playing, you know, prior to that tournament. So just keep that in mind. And you can see the optimal lineups here, 100% frequency of these three recent form ranges. And I mean, recent form three is, is very borderline of being a must play, you know, playing at least one of them. But this is saying there is a chance that it could show up zero. And, you know, that, that's the case. That's the case. But you can all, always use the max projections as, you know, your safeguard uh, that's kind of how I like to look at it you know this will be like one to three this will be zero to two um, I just don't know how many I'm just gonna make sure that there are one I might just go zeros for all of these and just you know round up with these ones so three two three three so it's a variation of recent forms it's an, this is why I like the bucket system because it's telling you all of these are viable and all of them have shown inside the optimal lineup for the last four years. Obviously that's how long we've had salaries. Um, but you can also see the minimum of showing inside the top 10 is also 100% frequency rate. So you want to vary it up. Don't just choose all golfers that have really good recent form. Um, again, that's why I love the bucket system because it, it, it kind of takes your bias out of it. Like, yeah, you do want one that has somewhat bad recent form. You probably want one that has a missed cut, and I'm sure that's where the recent form falls in there. But we'll see, because I'm going to definitely pull that up here uh, quickly or shortly by looking at the last year and last week buckets. So let's pull up the last week or the last year bucket. Uh, your number one bucket far and away, the best of all, is a top 20 finish at this tournament. Last week, we talked about this with the AT&T uh, Pebble Beach Pro-Am, where I, there was a trend, nine or 10 of the last 13 winners had had a top 16 the week before. Well, you, that's kind of like in line with the bucket system, right? We look at the top, we go by 20 increments or 20 place increments. We're looking at top 20s. We know that there was 100% frequency rate there at the Pebble Beach Pro-Am of having a golfer from this bucket finish inside the top 10. It looks exactly the same this week. And guess what? Tom Hoagie won that tournament last week uh, at the at t Pebble Beach pro and he had a top 20 finish. I can't remember what it was, maybe top 14, top 16. Either way, that trend follows. This trend is going to follow. People playing here, having success here, it works. So definitely consider that. Whereas when we looked at course history, course history was all over the place. Again, taking a look. You know, it's all over the place with frequencies. There's not one that says, hey, play me more than another, like 
for these four buckets did not play 1 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60. However, looking at last year, it's pretty much just last year ones and did not plays. The rest of them, yeah, it's not terrible, but it's also not great. And you can see the frequency rates drop considerably. The success rates aren't that great. My projections aren't that great for those either. Um, just keep that all in mind. Making sure all the numbers match, and they do. And that's probably because most of your good golfers are in these two buckets. So just keep all of that in mind. One to three for um, my projections, and then one to four for the did not plays. I'm sorry, one to three for the one to 20s, you know, who finished here last year inside the top 20, and then golfers who didn't play last year. Right here, this bucket, uh, we want one, one to four. So keep that all in mind, and you can see also how often these have shown inside the optimal lineup. I mean, it looks, it looks pretty, uh, pretty consistent. And then the last bucket to look at, the last stat to look at, last week finishes. Uh, this one is dominated by did not plays. So if you do like a golfer or you're hemming and hawing between one and another, if they didn't play, give them a leg up. That's definitely the bucket you want to be choosing from. Uh, this one and top 20s from last week are the only 100% frequency rates to finish inside the top 10. But also to note, we don't have 100% frequency inside the optimal lineup. So this is another one, in my opinion, that's kind of wide open. Uh, it did not play, just they, they reign supreme. We can have top 10 finishes that aren't in the optimal lineup. Uh, it's just easier to build lineups based off of top 10s than it is optimal lineups because we get to look at 10 golfers as opposed to six. And really last week threes, or um, we call them last week threes, but they're one to 20. So having a top 20 last week, pretty darn good. I feel comfortable with this. Um, well, this is why we add strength to field. So maybe not so much. You know, your biggest bucket is definitely down here and it's because of how much the strength of field is. We'll take one look at golfers through this. So we're looking at last week threes, top 20s. So if we look here, we are not projecting of the group of golfers you see on the screen that I've just highlighted. Those golfers, there's a chance none of them finished inside the top 10. Like there's a good chance none of them finished inside the top 10, which is very concerning because you do have Patrick Cantlay there. You have Jordan Spieth there. And we also have Matt Fitzpatrick. So looking at that summary again, a min of 0.68 to a max of 1.14. Those aren't great numbers. 29 is the strength of field for real? So Spieth, how many points does he add to it? Spieth is 21, Cantley is 33. So I'm thinking that's not right. Can't be right. All right, we're gonna make an update on the fly. I need to look at F3. I want. Right. Did I copy their numbers down wrong? Cantley is the last week two. Interesting. Okay. Let's see, I have the right here are our these are the rankings, so that is correct. It's ranking them correctly there. Shoot. Um, it's a bummer. I think we got to flip those buckets around now. Uh, the did not plays and the top 20s. So now it would look like you want top 20s in your group. 
here. Okay. Here's what we're going to do real quick. I just want to show you to make sure you guys know which ones you want. So looking at that summary again, last week, threes are top 20s. And then what it goes last week fives, then last week fours, then last week sixes, then last week twos. Gosh, I can't believe that happened. This should update those numbers, so it should be pretty easy to tell. And these are all your missed cuts. So Kevin Kisner. And then ones are did not play it. Okay. So this should already update them, and it does. The projection ends up becoming a one to two, which is good. 90 points go towards that strength of field. Um, Sorry about that, guys. I don't, I have no idea why that, I copy it from another sheet and may, you know, okay, I know what happened. I forgot as I was building all this out, I forgot to add those here. It was a bummer. Makes me think I'm, I'm probably gonna have to look at the rest of them, but I think those were exactly what you wanted. I mean, it's all based off of frequencies. So if you guys saw any discrepancy, let's, let's open them all up. Last year, 32, boom, that's, that's number one. 27 is two, 15 is three. Yep, that all works out. One's 34, two is 23, three is 19, 13, that works out. First is three, one's is 18, 17, 16, 15. And again, these rankings are based off of these numbers right here. It's your frequencies. How often have they shown up inside the top 10? And then recent forms, let's see one with 27, two with 24. Yep, that all matches out, so. Yeah, it was just looking at the last, the last week. It somehow got um, saved incorrectly. So again, okay. Looking at last week's, here we go. Instead of that zero to one, now we do have a one to two. It's pretty darn close though that this bucket doesn't, it, it looks like it's gonna produce at least one, but it's really close to not. So as we again, look at those golfers um, and just do it like this. Of course, I remembered the wrong way. We're looking at last week threes. Uh, again, Concerning because you've got Cantley and Spieth as well as Fitzpatrick, Power, Hoagie. You want one to two of these guys. So when you're building your lineups and you're feeling really good, like you want to add more, maybe just restrict yourself from doing that. Probably the best way to go. Again, the number one bucket are the did not plays, and you already saw a bunch of those guys. I mean, you got. It's, it's John Rahm. And this is only looking at the PGA Tour. So people coming from Saudi, I don't have them in here as a golfer that did play last week. But you can see most of your 10K golfers are here as well as your 9K golfers. This bucket is definitely going to dominate. Um, and if not there, we have a slew of 7 and 6K golfers that can also um, make a good... Uh, they're going to compete for you know, top 10 placements. So that is all that I have for the bucket. Sorry about that at the end there. Um, hey, work it, fixing it on the fly. You guys can see what it looks like. Just shows you guys I'm not cheating you. I'm not lying to you guys. Uh, definitely want you guys to have all of the information, all the truth you possibly can get to make the best decisions for yourself. So um, very interesting. Definitely last year's stats seem to matter the most. At least that's where we had kind of the biggest discrepancies. Whether you play there, or I should say this. For those that do play, target those that have top 20s. Those that didn't play, or then you would target those that didn't play. So look for top 20s probably first because it's an easier one to select from. And then look at golfers who didn't play last year. And those are your top two buckets when it comes to last, last year's stats. Last week's stats. Uh, definitely did not plays. I mean, we're projecting around seven of them finishing inside the top 10, anywhere between three to seven, which is enormous. Um, and then the only other bucket that seems to have any kind of, you know, chance to at least have one golfer finish inside the top 10 is your last week threes, which are top 20s from last week. So either they didn't play or they top 20, which is very similar to what the last year stats look like. 
And then course history really doesn't matter. It's pretty open, pretty even. Recent form, you definitely want to have decent recent form coming in here. Um, but it's 1 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60 for your average finishing places dating back uh, seven for, for the last seven tournaments. Um, oh, we didn't talk about stroke scan stats. Let's do that real quick. So how I like to look at stroke scan stats, I look at all stats positive. That's number one. That's your stroke scan one. Stroke scan two through five are only looking at off the tee and putting. The stats in between for approach around the green can be anything. But as it, it goes as follows for stroke scan two and down, it's positive off the tee, positive putting for two. For three, it's positive off the tee, negative putting. And then it flips, it's negative off the tee, positive putting for stroke scan four. Negative off the tee, negative putting for stroke scan five. And then stroke scan six is no stroke scan stats, which we only have one golfer in the field that has no stroke scan stats for the entire last year. And that's what we're looking at, last year stats. One entire year, going all the way back to the Waste Management Open. Um, that's all I'm looking at uh, for stroke scan stats. So you can see, we basically want one of each of all positive, positive off the tee, positive putting with one negative stat in between, positive off the tee, negative putting with one stat in between that, well, actually that stat can be whatever it wants to be. Um, we're looking at one of those. So it looks like positive off the tee is definitely something you want to be shooting for. Uh, and then just mix in your putting stats and mix in all your stats. I'm looking in the future of adding a column, at least for these buckets, to show how many of them have positive approach stats. Because as I was kind of doing a dive into this, I saw most of these buckets had positives, um, like the, the ones that showed inside the top 10, had positive approach stats. So I think that just makes sense. We definitely want to be looking at approach stats just to see, you know, you know, of how many show up in each of these buckets, which of them had positive, you know, approach stats. Because that will help us narrow down our player pools even more. So those are your strokes gain stats. Um, again, read the projections as minimums, you round down, maximums, you round up, and then kind of just fit in the mold with the rest of the buckets. So if you kind of skipped ahead to this one, I did kind of already do a little breakdown of the buckets just prior to the strokes gain. So just rewind a little bit and you'll see them there. Outside of that, I got nothing else to add. Sorry for this coming out so late. Um, this weekend, I was out of town, hanging out with a group of friends, having a good time. I forget how much it takes to update this stuff. And when you have a nine to five job and you can't really work on it, you gotta wait till after five to update everything. So yeah, this one's coming out late. It's a little longer than I want it to be. I want it to be like 25, 30 minutes usually. Um, we'll work on that. But I thought this video was good, very informative. Got all the information I wanted to out. So hopefully you guys feel the same way. Uh, and with that, I got nothing else to add other than remember giveaways. Rewind to the beginning of the uh, video to see what you need to do in order to win some money this week. That's all I got for you guys. So thank you for watching. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.